I'm alive. Uh, I shouldn't be. He should not be alive. This is unfucking believable. <laughs> From the heart of trucker America, my boy Reed Coverdale, host of the Naturalist Capitalist. This is what government does. It sucks. If you think you're going to win people over by stating commonplaces, you're just selling the other part. It is about dictating every transaction that you have for the rest of your life. Mr. Potato Head. Coverdale is the guy to be president of the United States. You intimidated me with your perfect 74 staff. That was the beginning of my problems. He died doing what he loved, chasing a minor. But I'll put a 50 cal attached to my suburban. Libertarians need to get out of New York. The right. log is going to be in your house. This guy's a fucking murderer. He deserves to be in a dungeon. Get him out of that truck at night and get him into the White House. I'm here at Freedom Fest in Las Vegas, and I'm with Ben Swan. Ben, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you, Reed? I'm doing well. This is our second go. We had some technical difficulties, so we're going to try this again. But, uh, Ben, you're a very interesting guy, and I very recently found out about you, and I've just been doing some research over the last few days. I joined uh -oh. Sovereign, which I know you're helping kickstart. Or, is that your own thing, actually? It is. Okay. It is. It's something that, we, that I've launched, yeah. Okay. We'll get into that later, but yeah. um, I started looking into you, and the coolest thing I found out about you was you confronting Barack Obama about the drone strike kill list that he had, and he didn't yeah. deny that he had it. Yeah. Um, amazing moment. Uh, yeah. Just tell us a little bit about that. Sure, absolutely. So this was back in 2012. You know, I was covering um, politics in Ohio, the swing state of all swing states, and the president came through, and it, it, backing up a couple of weeks, prior to that, I had interviewed every Republican candidate who had come through the area, including interviewing Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan immediately after they took the nomination. They were the first, I was the first interview they did. Uh, and I was very hard on them during that interview about a lot of the, the issues at the time, including you might remember, there was a lot about this heartbeat bill um, that some senator from Missouri had been behind, Paul Ryan was connected to it, and they were trying to deny that they had anything to do with it. So I was very hard on them. Because I was hard on them, the, the campaign manager for Obama's Ohio campaign was watching, saw it, and said, oh, that's the guy I want to interview the president when he comes here, because they assumed I would softball Obama, right? They made that mistake of thinking, if you're hard on these guys, you must be easy on us. So they set it up for me to interview him. Five questions is all you get. They told me, you'll be lucky if you get two or three questions in. Turns out I got five questions in seven and a half minutes, because he hated the question so much, he didn't want to answer them. But we got to talk about his kill list, why he thought, as a president, he had the power to uh, kill U.S. citizens without a trial, no due process. Uh, we talked about the war in Afghanistan, why he hadn't come to an end. We talked about Al-Qaeda in Syria, which at the time everyone said was a conspiracy theory. There's no Al-Qaeda in Syria. These are rebels who are fighting against the government, and there's no terrorists in those groups. And of course, it wasn't not only Al-Qaeda, but it would later become ISIS uh, that was there. And then we talked about um, uh, oh, the NDAA and the ability to indefinitely detain U.S. citizens. One thing I thought was important about that interview, though, is that Obama was a, a constitutional lawyer, right? Right, and as president, was probably violating the U.S. Constitution and his presidential powers more than his predecessors had, or even those who have come after him since. So it's kind of an interesting, uh, I think, you know, comparison when you see someone who's a constitutional lawyer now turned president who can't follow the Constitution. Yeah, you were talking about how. The, uh, you know, the whole idea that we were aiding Al-Qaeda and ISIS in Syria was a conspiracy theory that has turned out to be true. Um, with the war in Ukraine, we've had a lot of this type of stuff where people have called things conspiracy theories or oh, said they're yes. not true, but the rate at which we have found out that they are true has been much faster than it has in the past. Yes. It's been amazing to see how many people are waking up, like the Ghost of Kiev story was just yes. fake. The Snake Island story was also fake. Uh, the mass graves of Mariupol were fake. Yep. Like all these things are the, not the, real. The, be the beauty queen, remember the Ukrainian beauty queen who picked up her her rifle and went to war. And turns out they were old pictures from her with an airsoft rifle. It wasn't even a real rifle, and it was from like 2017. It's all fake. Yeah. No, I mean, are you optimistic that things have accelerated so quickly that people have no option but to wake up, or do you think they're still going to continue ignoring everything? No, I think I think a lot of people are waking up. I think COVID woke up. Uh, far more people than independent media ever could have, right? Going through the experience, because there is a cognitive dissonance for people when you can tell them all day long you're being lied to, you're being tricked, you're being deceived, the government's doing this, they're telling you one thing and they're doing another, and people will hear that, but they still have their lives to get to. 
what COVID did is it shook people awake because they were suddenly told, actually, you don't have a life to go to. You can't go to work and your kids can't go to school and you have to walk around with this face diaper on all day long and, and you have to get vaccinated in order to have a job. And, and so all of a sudden people who normally would, would remain asleep because it's just easier or, or in fairness, they're too busy to worry about those things, no longer had a choice. They had to deal with it. So in my point is the attempt to squash um, this movement of free thinking has only accelerated the movement of free thinking. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, when they suppress information, whether or not it's true or good information, they validate it, Absolutely. you know? So Absolutely. sometimes it's because you're over the target, so they don't want you to talk about it. But if you're not even over the target, what you're saying is completely wrong. If they start suppressing it, you instantly validate whoever's asking questions. You oh, know? for sure, absolutely. And and, and it's it's like that old analogy, right? Where you, where you put something in your hand and you squeeze it tight enough and it squeezes out through your fingers, you can't right. hold it, right? Be, and that's really what begins to happen with information. I know so many people, because I'm constantly censored on YouTube, constantly, well, I'm, I'm off YouTube, but constantly censored on Facebook and Instagram, and they'll constantly put these, these warnings on my reports where they'll block it out and say, missing context or incorrect information. I have so many people who will say, I didn't notice it until they did that, and so I watched it. Yeah. Because I, they're so to the point where if, if Facebook's telling them it's not true, they now automatically assume it is true. Yeah. Yeah, so that's almost, it's almost dangerous now. Like, I have noticed that there is an intentional narrative and then there's an intentional counter narrative. And the first time we were trying to interview, we were talking about Pizzagate, and you were talking about how you had just had questions about John Podesta's emails and stuff he'd said on his phone that was creepy toward children. What you get is you get these crazy stories about Hillary Clinton eating children in the basement or whatever. Um, I feel a lot of times like that's almost pushed Oh. by the CIA because they want to completely discredit any skepticism because then, you know, whenever there's questioning of the official narrative, they can just point to the bullshit counter narrative, uh, bullshit counter narrative and be like, this yeah. is what anyone who questions what we say believes, you know? So, so you're absolutely right, 100% in everything you just said. The only thing I would add to that is we hear a term used a lot now, nowadays that didn't used to be used, which is disinformation. Right. What you just described, when government agents, when intentional plants start to plant stories in order to obscure uh, the truth, that's actual disinformation, right? right? So you hear all this talk about, oh, there's misinformation and disinformation out there. People who say it, masks don't work, they're pushing disinformation. No, no, no. The people who are saying things like, oh, Clinton's eating, eating babies in a dungeon, uh, and we really believe it, those people are pushing dis dis disinformation because what they're doing is they're trying to put out so many crazy theories that any reasonable person, when they begin to look at it, will say, I don't even know what to believe. Right, yeah. So I don't even know how to touch it. Right. And that's why they're so afraid of people like me, um, quite candidly, is because as a, as a journalist and a, and a credible journalist at the time working for CBS, got up on television and said, well, actually, let me just tell you how this works, right? Um, nobody's, nobody actually thinks this is where it comes from. It doesn't come from Macedonian sheep farmers, as they claim. It comes from John Podesta left his cell phone in a taxi cab. Yeah. Some guys read it, I'll tell you the truth, and some pedophiles on 4chan said, uh, I don't think you guys know what this stuff means, but this is how we talk to each other. That's really where it came from. That's yeah. how it started. But you're never going to get to that because they have to create as many crazy theories as possible. And that's happening right now with, with so many, so many different issues. Yeah, and now with uh, Maxwell actually getting sentenced to 20 years, um, I can't tell you how many times whenever I try to talk about Epstein, Maxwell, uh -huh. I get hit with, oh, this dumb Pizzagate theory again. I mean, it, it's, it's almost like it was a preparation for, you know, this coming out like they knew they were going to get caught eventually so the more they could you know the more ridiculous they could make the counter narrative the less people would take it seriously when it comes out because i mean you know most people don't believe jeffrey epstein actually killed himself and oh, jeffrey you know, epstein absolutely did of not course kill not, himself yeah. right <laughs> i mean look the, the I, conspiracy theories it is a far greater conspiracy theory to believe that jeffrey epstein was so suicidal that he decided to kill himself three days after he was badly beaten by another inmate who attempted to kill him. 
right. that the guards on the day that he killed himself decided to not check up on him, that none of the cameras in the cell block that he's in happened to work that day, that he managed to have the, the, the right uh, tools necessary in order to choke himself to death, right? These are the kinds of things where you say, well, if you lay it out, it doesn't make sense at all. It takes far more faith or theory right. to believe that Jeffrey Epstein killed himself than it is to say, oh yeah, turn the cameras off, guards don't check on him, he, someone tries to choke him two or three days before, and now he's suddenly dead in the cell. Yeah. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah, totally. Uh, the whole thing with Epstein that annoys me is that some people who are honing in on it a little bit, it seems like they're missing the big point here. So instead of just you know realizing that a lot of our elected officials and people in media and tech and everything, have done these dirty things, they don't understand why all this blackmailing was taking place in the first place. And when you start looking at the Les Wexner Foundation, you know, pushing for the war in Iraq, and then you find out Les Wexner financed the properties for Epstein, all these connections are really sinister. Are you worried about that too, that people are kind of missing the bigger point of what's going on here? Well, I, I think that, that, so in reality, when it comes to Epstein, we're never going to know, uh -huh. right? We're never going to know whether or not he was a honeypot. I think there's a lot of evidence that, that shows he was Mossad. Yes. Um, and that he was a honeypot on their behalf. Yep. Um, if you know anything, it sounds like you know a lot about this. I do. Ghislaine Maxwell's father. Robert um, Maxwell. Yep. Robert Maxwell was an, a Mossad agent. Yep. Um, he ran that magazine empire in the UK. Um, he committed suicide by jumping naked off of a yacht and drowning. Yeah. Um, it and runs then, in the family. It runs in say? the family. <laughs> and then it just so happens this, let's, let's be honest, this, this know-nothing kind of buffoon guy that she picks up with suddenly winds up with $600 million in the bank and no yeah. one knows how. No one knows where his money comes from. Lex Wexner gets a, 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 attached to him, who's running Victoria's Secret. And, I mean, the, the, the story that surrounds Epstein is two things. It's incredibly complicated, but it's also out there. Yeah. It's not even really hidden. Right. It shows you how much work has been done to hide this story that they're not even really hiding the story, right? right. We also know that, that Epstein was deeply connected to all these different powerful people. Everyone knows that. Um, but we also know this, that Ghislaine Maxwell just got 20 years in prison. And not one person to whom she sold a child has been charged with anything. Yeah. Not one person to whom she trafficked a girl, a young girl, has been charged. That also tells you everything you need to know. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, the other thing is with all this, um, you know, we, we, we really, like, haven't wanted to believe any of it, I think. Like, a lot of us, at least for me, like, when I first started looking into this, I was like, this is not something that I actually want to believe is happening you know what i mean and like that was kind of one of the big red pills to swallow sure. like these people really are psychopaths and they really do hate us and they really do want to murder us and i feel like it's because it was being pushed solely by a small group of people that i just really didn't have any affinity for but as time goes on that group is getting bigger and bigger because everyone's getting disenfranchised everyone's getting censored everyone's being pushed out of the sort of uh you know mainstream circle that they used to be in so well, you were saying earlier, like COVID woke up a lot of people, um, you know, and now I'm banned off of Twitter. Um, and, and what I, did you do? What did you do to get you, yourself banned well, on Twitter? Well, this time it was just for this evading time. the ban of my current <laughs> account. And so the first time um, I threatened violence against somebody when it was a joke with a friend, and that was the end. Um, you know, I've seen Alec Baldwin make tweets where he's directly calling for killing people. Right. You can say you want to go bomb Iran or you want to go to right. war with China, and that's yep. completely fine. Or you can say you want to kill all Russians yeah, yeah. right now. Exactly. I'm totally yeah. fine with that. All those things are completely fine. But uh, if you make a joke with someone, you know, that's, that's bannable. But it seems like um, not only are more and more people starting to realize what's going on, but more and more people are being called Nazis or Russian assets or you know, conspiracy theorists that they're like, you know what, okay, fine. Um, I don't care what you think anymore and I am gonna start listening to everybody who's, you yep. know, pushing these things. Yeah, so. well, it, what's interesting is the terminology keeps changing, the slur stays the same. So even a few years ago, I was being slurred as being called alt-right. Right. That was a very short-lived slur. It didn't last very long, right? Yeah. Remember, for a very short time, everybody was alt-right. Then all of a sudden, well, they let go of the alt-right thing and then they moved on to Nazis, right. fascists, now it's Putin's puppet, 
right? Yeah. Which I get called that a lot. You're Putin's puppet. If you criticize what the U.S. is doing by giving 70 billion of our dollars, tax dollars, because we've given a total of 70. This last round was 40, but in total we've given 70 billion to Ukraine, to right. the corrupt oligarchs who run Ukraine, to the to the U.S. Uh, position puppet, right? Dancing with the stars, leather bondage wearing Zelensky. <laughs> Yeah. If you criticize that while kids in the U.S. don't have baby formula, right? Oh, you're Putin's puppet. You're saying what Putin wants you to say. Well, you know what? If Putin thinks that, I guess we're on the same side. Yeah, for sure. So speaking of being pushed out of these mainstream bubbles, you are starting the platform Sovereign. Yes. You want to tell people about how, what Sovereign is, like what type of platform is it? Sure. Can they put videos on it? Is it more like Twitter? What What, what is this uh, platform designed to be? Yeah, so so it is not designed to be a knockoff of Twitter. I think with Gitter and Truth Social and Parler, there's enough of those yeah, out there. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> we, we are basically uh, very similar to Facebook in a lot of ways in that uh, there's a news feed that you have. When you, when you log on, you create an account. You can follow creators who are on there. You can post right now, but if you're not an approved creator, you can't post video yet. We'll get to the point very soon where, where everyone can do that. The actually, the reason we didn't, I, I can tell your audience, I'm sure they'll appreciate this, is because we knew if we started that way, we'd have a bunch of fake accounts and disinformation, right. posting a whole bunch of like neo-Nazi stuff so they could smear us and say, oh, look, they're, they're a hate website, they're a white nationalist website. Uh, and so we've been very careful about, about ramping that up. Um, in terms of who's able to post video. But we're gonna expand that out. Um, we also have a groups function, similar to Facebook groups, called Sovereign Circles, uh, which is a circles function. It allows you to have live chat with your groups and then to interact with each other, share posts. But the other thing that we're doing, we've got a bunch of features we're about to roll out in September, the most secure private messenger in the world. It's gonna be built into our system as an API. Uh, video chat that's allowed in there, um, which is totally secure as well. Uh, we have live streaming that's gonna come on, online. Uh, so we have a whole set of kind of features because our goal, I think one of the things that everyone else is missing, Rumble is missing, um, what what uh, Gitter and, and Parler are missing, is they are creating locations for content creators. But what we're doing is we're losing the social and social media. The thing that made Facebook work, the thing that made social media so successful, in my opinion, because I don't think I don't see Twitter as a very successful social media. Right. It's for people to go to yell at each other. But where Facebook was good was it was a place where people could go and interact with each other and share within their communities. That's why, for me, Facebook video was always a very good thing. In 2016, I did almost 200 million video views on Facebook video because people in their social circles would watch something and say, ah, oh, this stuff's great, and they'd share it with their circle. But we're losing that. And so if, if, you, if you try to emulate what Twitter's doing, Twitter really doesn't have a, a social feature, a sharing right. feature. So we're trying to bring that back into this space. It's all backed up by blockchain technology, which makes us uncensorable. We can't be taken down. We can't be removed. We're trying to protect our users and make sure that they have the ability to create content, put it online, and, and rest assured knowing it's not going to get taken down. Yeah. Well, whether, it's, whether it's by us, by the way, or by the government. Yeah, no, I love that. I mean, Odyssey is a great video platform I use, and that's kind of been the way they've gone about things. Yes. And there's actually been free speech there. Yes. So I'm super excited. I have signed up for it. You guys can go follow me there. I'll have a link in the description to all this stuff. Ben, thank you so much for coming on. I'd like to talk to you again sometime, Absolutely. do a longer form conversation. I'd I really love to like. do it. If I can just say real quick to, to, to folks who want to sign up for it, it's Sovereign, S-O-V-R-E-N dot media, dot, dot com dot media. You can check us out there. Also, we have a progressive web app, which means if you have a, an Android or an Apple phone, you can actually open it up, hit your share button, and save us to your home screen, and you never access us through the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. So we're totally free of those terms of service. All right, awesome. Well, guys, go check out Sovereign. It's cool. Check out Ben Swan on all the different uh, social media places he's still allowed to be. Ben, thank you for coming on. Great. Thanks, Reed.